Hey guys, this is Mr. Millings, and in this video, we are going to learn about potential energy versus kinetic energy. And before we start talking about potential energy and kinetic energy, we should probably start talking about energy in general. So what is energy? Well, it says right here that energy is the ability to do work or cause a flow of heat. And that work is done when a force that is applied to an object displaces that object okay so essentially energy is the ability to do work or cause a flow of heat and the term energy was first used by a, a, a British scientist that lived in the 17 and 1800s by the name of Thomas Young and in this little video we're gonna learn about potential energy versus kinetic energy and we're gonna talk about the law of conservation of energy but if we take a look over here we can take a look and see these wind turbines right here that are responsible for generating a lot of energy right which allows us to do many things that we do whether it's operate a cell phone or uh, watch a television uh, we can owe that to some uh, energy that was produced by these wind turbines if we take a look right here we have another form of energy this electricity right here or the uh, the lightning that we see coming from the sky comes with a, a tremendous amount of energy carried within it. And if we take a look right here at this geothermal energy plant in Iceland, same thing here. The uh, energy plant here is using uh, thermal energy that comes from deep within the earth to generate energy that we can use in our daily lives. All right, so energy once again is the ability to do work or cause a flow of heat. And now let's talk about the law of conservation of energy and then discuss the different types or forms of energy and potential versus kinetic energy. And before we start talking about the different forms of energy and kinetic versus potential energy, let's talk about the law of conservation of energy. All right, the law of conservation of energy, which is also known as the first law of thermodynamics, states that the energy of the universe is constant. So what does that mean that the energy of the universe is constant? Well, this means that if we go back to about 15 billion years ago to the point of the Big Bang and we measure the amount of energy that was in that tiny little golf ball sized universe, it would have the exact same amount of energy as it does today, 15 billion years later. All right. And that is because the law of conservation of energy states that the universe of, I'm sorry, the uh, energy of the universe is constant. All right, so what we had 15 billion years ago is the same that we have today. Okay, and because of this concept, uh, the idea of perpetual motion machines uh, just just can't happen. They violate the, the, the law of conservation of energy. All right, so if we take a look right here at this little magazine uh, from the early 1900s, we can see... Uh, that scientists uh, from that time period were uh, were attempting to develop some perpetual motions perpetual motion machines that were in contradiction and violation of the law of conservation of energy. You cannot create energy. You cannot destroy energy. Energy is just transferred from one form to another. Okay, so. The law of conservation of energy tells us that the energy of the universe is constant and that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Instead, what ends up happening is that it gets transferred from one form to another over time. Okay, so if we take a look at all these different perpetual motion machines, the overbalanced wheel, the capillary bowl, or this little uh, perpetual motion wheel uh, from Leonardo da vinci they're all impossible all right they all violate this law of conservation of energy okay so let's now start talking about the different forms of energy and take a look at the law of conservation of energy uh, in, in greater detail okay and so let's talk a little bit about the different forms of energy and it says right here that though there are many forms of energy all energy on this planet can be traced back to the sun through a series of different energy transfers so if we take a look for example we have the sun right here and what ends up happening is that this little plant through photosynthesis uh, absorbs the sunlight and converts uh, the sunlight energy uh, along with some carbon dioxide and some water it converts it to uh, this little plant that grows over time okay so we have light energy from the sun being transferred into 
different forms of energy that are within the, uh, the, the little plant cells themselves. And so what ends up happening is that this plant here produces a little tomato. An animal is going to come and eat this little tomato. This tomato is made up of different other types of uh, uh, forms of energy like sugar or glucose right and so that animal develops uh, its biomass from eating this little tomato at which point we then eat the animal and so we're able to burn those calories throughout our uh, normal activity throughout the day and so energy from the sun gets transferred over and over and over and over and over again to different forms okay and so basically all energy on our planet can trace its origins back to the sun okay so understand that concept of the law of conservation of energy that energy is not created nor destroyed it's just transferred over and over and over again from one form to another and so if we take a look at several different kinds or forms of energy we have electric energy we have light energy we have nuclear energy that comes from the nucleus of atoms we have potential energy we have kinetic energy chemical energy thermal energy or heat and magnetic energy as well so these are all different forms of energy that can be transferred from one form to another through different types of physical or chemical processes okay so understand that concept of the law of conservation of energy how it's transferred from one form to another over time and that the energy of the universe is constant energy is not created nor destroyed so now let's take a look at two different kinds or forms of energy. Let's take a look at potential energy and kinetic energy and see how they relate to one another. And so now let's go ahead and talk about two forms of energy. Let's talk about potential energy first and then let's talk about kinetic energy. So what is potential energy? Well, it says right here that potential energy is stored energy and gravitational potential energy is related to how high above Earth's surface an object is. And we also have elastic potential energy, which refers to the amount of potential energy and an extended uh, spring or a rubber band or a slinky or something of that nature or a coil. Okay, so potential energy is stored energy. For example, the, uh, the energy that's stored behind this wall, right? We have a bunch of water that's stored behind this dam right here. This is a, an image of the Hoover Dam. And behind this huge wall right here is a, an insane amount of water. And so what ends up happening is they can open up these little gates that the water can rush through. So we have potential energy being converted into kinetic energy, which turns these huge turbines and generates electricity uh, that allows us to use our cell phones and our televisions, etc., etc. All right, so potential energy is stored energy, kind of like the stored energy that is in this battery right here, right? We have stored energy that is in this battery. We can also have potential energy that is stored in the chemical bonds of this water molecule, right? We have hydrogen right here and right here bonded to an oxygen atom, and there is a, an amount of energy uh, that exists in this little bond right here between the hydrogen and oxygen atom and that's going to be potential energy and also if we take a look at this little Snickers bar or this candy bar right here we have uh, some potential energy that is stored in this little candy bar right here we then eat this and digest it and break it down into other forms of energy that allows us to move throughout the day allows us our, our brains to process information, et cetera, et cetera. So potential energy is stored energy. It's stored energy. And if we stretch a rubber band, then uh, that will be one example of potential energy or elastic potential energy. Okay, so potential energy, when we're trying to figure out how much potential energy an object has that is a certain height above Earth's surface, it's quite simple. To figure out the potential energy, we have to know the mass of the object in kilograms. We have to multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared for all objects on planet Earth, no matter how heavy or massive, times the height in meters above the Earth's surface. So if we know these three, three things about an object, we can calculate the gravitational potential energy. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. It says right here that a flower pot has a mass of 2.5 kilograms and sits on a balcony 30 meters above the ground. How much potential energy does the flower pot have? So in order to get the potential energy of this flower pot, it's simple. We take the mass in kilograms, which it says right here is 2.5.
times the uh, acceleration due to gravity, and this is always the same. This is a constant, okay? This is the gravitational constant. So we have 9.8 meters per second squared times the height, right? The height above Earth's surface is going to be 30 meters. And when we put this in our calculator, we are going to end up with 735 kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared. So kilograms times meters squared per second squared. Okay. And when we have this unit right here, this funky unit right here, this ends up just being converted into joules. This is the same thing. So we have 735 joules of potential energy that is stored in this flower pot that is 30 meters above the ground. Okay, so anything that is above the Earth's surface that is uh, teetering on a ledge or, uh, or on, a, on, a, on a cliff, perhaps a rock or a boulder of some sort, it's going to have some sort of, a, uh, it's going to have a certain amount of potential energy. And that's how we're going to calculate that right there. Let's talk about kinetic energy. All right, so what is kinetic energy? Well, it says right here that kinetic energy is the energy of motion and that anything that is in motion or that is in that is moving has kinetic energy so if we take a look at this f16 right here it's definitely in motion therefore it has kinetic energy if we take a look at this race car right here it's in motion therefore it has kinetic energy and if we take a look at the youth football players right here they're definitely in motion the football's in motion they have kinetic energy so kinetic energy is the energy of motion and anything that is moving has kinetic energy so how can we find how much kinetic energy something in motion has well to get the kinetic energy of something it's simple we use this little formula right here one half mv squared where the mass of the object is in kilograms and the velocity of the object is in meters per second. So let's take a look at an example. It says a school bus has a mass of 18,000 kilograms. If it is traveling 11.2 meters per second, then how much kinetic energy does the school bus have? So to get the kinetic energy here, we're simply going to take one half the mass times the velocity squared. So the mass of this is 18,000 kilograms. And it looks like the velocity is 11.2 meters per second. But we're going to end up squaring this, right? We're going to end up squaring this right here. So there we go. So now we can go ahead and put this in our calculator. And if we do that, we will end up with 1.1 times 10 to the 6th. kilograms times meters squared per second squared which is equal to 1.1 times 10 to the 6 joules okay so if we have a school bus that has this mass right here and it's moving this fast it is going to have this much kinet uh, kinetic energy 1.1 times 10 to the 6 joules all right so now let's take a look at a little simulation where we can take a look and see uh, the relationship between potential energy and kinetic energy. And after the little simulation, I'm going to give you some sample problems to try on your own, just to test yourself. And so let's take a look at this little simulation where we have this skateboarder on some sort of ramp. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to throw this little skateboarder on the ramp here and take a look at what happens to the uh, kinetic and potential energies uh, of this skateboarder, assuming that there is no friction. In other words, there is no friction between the wheels and the ramp. There is no friction between the air and the skateboarder. So if there is no friction, or in a frictionless world, what's going to happen to the potential energies and kinetic energies of this skateboarder? As we can see on the bar graph on the left, right now as the skateboarder is really high above the Earth's surface, she has a lot of potential energy. But what do you think is going to happen to the skateboarder once she moves down the ramp. Well, as you see right here, as she moves down the ramp, the kinetic energy is going to increase and her potential energy is going to decrease as she gets closer to the Earth's surface. And as she moves up the ramp, the exact opposite happens. As she moves up the ramp, she's higher above the Earth's surface and therefore has more potential energy. And because she's starting to slow down as she travels up the ramp, the kinetic energy decreases. But you'll notice that the total energy in a frictionless world 
uh, stays the same. So the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is always going to equal what we see right here. Okay, and take a look also once we start to increase the mass of this uh, of this skateboarder. Once we increase the mass or weight of this skateboarder, then the kinetic and, and, and potential energies of the skateboarder also has a tendency to increase. And if we decrease the mass of this skateboarder, then she's not going to have as much potential and kinetic energy. All right, so potential and kinetic energy uh, have a lot to do with the mass of, uh, of the object that you're talking about. But let's take a look now at what happens when we add friction to the equation. Okay, what do you think is going to happen when we add friction to the equation? That is to say, the friction between the wheels and the ramp and the rider, uh, the skateboarder, and the air. Well, let's take a look at what happens. Okay, so let's put this skateboarder on our little ramp now. Now we have some friction added. And so let's take a look at what happens. As we can see, what ends up happening as she moves down the ramp, the potential energy is decreasing and her kinetic energy is increasing. But you'll notice that she's not traveling up the ramp higher than she was before. And that is because a lot of this energy is being converted into thermal energy. The friction of the, uh, the wheels on the ramp are generated, uh, generating a little bit of thermal energy. And if we were to add up all of the potential energy and kinetic energy and thermal energy from the friction, you guessed it, it would all add up to the total amount of energy that this skateboarder has. All right, so this is a good demonstration that shows you the law of conservation of energy in action, right? Energy is just transferred from one form to another. We're not losing any sort of energy. The potential and, and kinetic energies that the skateboarder has is just being converted into thermal energy from the wheels, uh, the friction of the wheels on the ramp itself. Okay, so understand that concept and that relationship of kinetic and potential energy and the amount of thermal energy that's, that's uh, being produced from the friction of the wheels on this little skateboard ramp. And so also what we can do is we can also start to adjust the friction. If there's hardly any friction, then she will continue on and on and on indefinitely. And uh, once we start to add some friction, then that potential in kinetic energy is going to get converted into thermal energy and she's eventually going to stop. Okay, so understand those relationships. And so what I would do at this point in the video is just stop it for about a minute or two and go ahead and try these out on your own. Are these descriptions examples of potential or kinetic energy? And I'm going to give you guys the uh, answers to these right about now. So how did you do? If you got these all right, then you have a, a fairly decent understanding of potential and kinetic energy. If you like what you see, go ahead and click that little bomb in the bottom right hand corner that's going to subscribe you to my channel. And feel free to leave any comments in the comments section down below. And I really hope you guys found this helpful.